to a being of self. Yeah. So we're going to first start with Surya Namaskar. Can everybody touch the partner on the left? Just to make sure that we're all on the same page. There's no room, guys. Go on to the left. All right. So uh, I'm Mukul Mohan. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, I run Microsoft Ventures for Asia Pacific, including the accelerator here in Bangalore. We have accelerators in Beijing and Seattle, Tel Aviv, and other places. And uh, very glad to be here, obviously for a lot of reasons. One of the first ones being that uh, we thought it would be great to just get a lot of people together who understand, love, and want to learn a lot about uh, big data. And we have uh, one of the best teams from San Francisco, along with uh, Ali Hunt uh, and the rest of this team here in Mumbai. Uh, so we thought we'd just get everybody together. This is meant to be an event where people can, uh, number one, uh, learn a little bit more about what are the different patterns people are seeing, learning a lot more about all the different things that, uh, that we're doing in big data, that other people are doing in big data. Uh, and then get a little bit of a better sense for the technology element of it. Uh, and then finally talk a little bit about uh, what you guys are doing so we can have a little bit more of a networking session. Fair enough? Okay, so before we get started, a quick show of hands. Can I get uh, Sumant and Ravi and, and Lance here for a couple of seconds, just facing the audience if you don't mind? Are you where are you? Can you also just come here really quick? Okay, so really quick, uh, how many of you guys are, are developers? Can you just get it? Developers, raise your hands. Okay, so it's a good about 50%? 50% of the crowd is developers. How many of you have done anything associated with Cassandra or Hadoop or with uh, Wow? Any other NoSQL kind of things? Alright, so that's the stack area. How many of you are developing analytics applications or not? Okay, how many of you are non-developers? How many of you don't want to raise your hands? <laughs> That's the biggest question. How many, how many of you want to be uh, entrepreneurs? Where is Shekhar Kirani? He better be raising his hand. How many of you are investors? Okay, you know, you know, you know whom to avoid. Right? <laughs> Uh, how many of you have actually invested in any company? The investors actually invested in a company in uh, big data? How many of you guys came here for small data? That's the new buzzword, guys. It has to be big and small. But I think that doesn't matter. I'm not thinking. Alright, so developers, we've got a good count with that. How many of you are from Bangalore? Uh, just a quick uh, quick question. Who's traveled the furthest away besides the guys from San Francisco, obviously. Anybody here from outside of India besides the guys from San Francisco? Anybody else from outside of India? Oh, wow. All right. Ah, a big hand for <laughs> so that's your crowd, guys, for most part. So, uh, I was advised to have you guys preferably keep the questions towards the end. Like the cohorts and all uh, Yeah, sure. So I don't know what it means. <laughs> we didn't talk about this, but since he may have, listen, I can tell jokes for the rest of my life. Uh, what I wanted to do was uh, have you guys also uh, get to know each other very, very well. So spend a lot of time after the event just trying to work with each other. As, as we know, you know, big data is so small right now that very few people know each other and it's a very relatively small community overall. Uh, so spend a lot of time with each other as much as you spend time with Ravi and Suman and with Lance and with Ravi and the rest of the folks. And uh, the other thing I wanted to say was if any of you guys are interested, uh, we tend to do these very frequently. So just drop a note to Arihan to me, and uh, we'd love to have you guys in any of our events uh, and, uh, and keep you guys up to date. Fair enough? I think that's about it. You're going to see the rest of the day, uh, rest of the evening, be fairly simple. We're going to have specific talks from folks uh, like Ravi, Suman, and Lance, Dr. Monty, and uh, Rajan, that's Rajan, right there. He's going to host a panel uh, of a few people that are uh, the experts in uh, being experts. So they will talk a little bit more about what the, I don't know, I'm sorry. I'm sure they know more about nothing. <laughs> I'm the king of that. But I keep talking for a lot of that. So we finish that portion and then we have a networking Q&A towards the end. And then you have to wait for the networking Q&A to get the food, I think, right? Yeah. So the only thing waiting between food and everything else is all of the having to wait. Uh, but with that, I'm going to turn it over to Arihant. He's going to have the first introduction. Suman. Suman. Okay, I'm going to turn it to Ali. Now I'm going to turn it to Suman. Suman's going to come and chat first. That's what happens. Okay. You, have, you have to have the guy who introduces the guy who's going to introduce this. So who wants to come and introduce Suman? So can we introduce the next guy? Um, I know the least about this topic amongst all the people that are going to talk about this stuff today. What I do know is uh, <coughs> a little bit about investing in companies, building companies from ideas and everything. 
So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about why this is interesting to me. Big data. You know, about uh, three years ago, I started hearing the word big data. Before that, there's a lot of people talking about SQL, people trying to use different technologies to make, uh, make applications work better than they were before. There's a lot of sort of open source stuff happening. Companies, we uh, get from Lance, who was part of the original team that created what now is in Overture, which was one of our companies to take part of Yahoo. Um, we worked with a gentleman called Gav who was known as uh, Main Hadoop after his, his son's little stuff, Elephant, which is why Hadoop had that little son. But it's a bunch of most of different technologies that was instigated by all of these companies. Um, all of these little technologies, and as far as I know, it was too hard to keep up with. And, um, you know, a few companies were trying to build technology solutions to make the and I didn't understand it until I met the uh, hands and probably and talked about it. Here's what's interesting to me. Every time investors get excited about a space, it's because there's a way of carrying things up, even the stuff that's not perfect, it's very valuable because there's a way you're writing. It's like surfing. You find it well, you get on the board, and if you have got any skill, you kind of write and you don't fall off. I fell off every time when I surfed. So I stopped. But in the investing side, when my fund was started, it was late 90s, and uh, you know the internet was very early, and we invested in a bunch of companies like uh, like Entry.com, Cars Direct. Uh, PayPal, etc., etc., and, and like other companies and other people in this, uh, in, at that time, things did very well. A lot of people created well. Same thing happened with social. Um, I believe that the big data trend is as big as not bigger. Um, here's some numbers. Now, I actually think that this is the this is very small, um, and this number is actually the wrong number to be focused on. I believe that this number is people selling technology into the world of big data, which is the actual underlying infrastructure of economies. What we are focused on here is the applications that sit on top of big data. Who, uh, who's not heard of this company? Raise your hand. You guys know what is. Okay, so this company, there are a few people who haven't heard of this company. Um, there are a lot of journalists say you should read some of their newspapers because this company's been on the table a lot recently. And the reason they have is they just raised a few hundred million dollars, valued the company at two and a half billion dollars. It's three and a half years for a very young company. It's disrupting the world of taxis by providing people access to information about where there, are, there is an availability of a free car or car service that you can get delivered on your mobile. Who's, uh, who's not heard of this? Very similar for, uh, for um, disruptions in the world of accommodations, hotel accommodations. This is a way for people to give their hotel to their, to their home, an extra room, an extra bed, and rent it out. Valued at a few billion dollars already. Third company, Waze. Anyone hasn't heard of this? Why you guys need to do some more reading? Because this company was just acquired by Google for 1.2 billion dollars. Very young company. Disrupting the world of traffic, a real pain for everyone, by using the data collected by a bunch of people helping each other. Now for me, this is the world of big data. This is these are applications that I created on top of it. These are applications created with people who understand someone's pain. Apply it to a massive audience, collect a massive amount of data, and then have some intelligence systems that make some value out of it. So that's the focus of the hype, is building applications on top of now what is an existing technology solution, which is big data. Um, nothing new, sensors are everywhere. Um, tons of data is being generated. So the last thing I read was like every year there is the amount of data that had existed all the years prior that has been created. So we are doubling the amount of data that has been created on a year by year basis. Um, people in this audience should know you work, you work mobile phones, you have applications on mobile phones, you have usage on those applications.
efficiency, the amount of data that is being generated, I think it's only going to grow. Um, people are getting used to the world of data. You know, I, I uh, this morning was reading the Wall Street Journal, and I think it was the Wall Street Journal, and there's New York Fashion Week that's happening in New York. Right now. It's a big deal in the US. It's in every newspaper. The fashion is very obviously sells newspapers. And the lead story was about a big data company in the world of fashion. Uh, this is that's very interesting, fashion designers and big data. So here's a company that collects data from multiple sources all over the world and then tells the fashion designer what the new trends that they are looking at are going to be. What are the, they're predicting trends based on the data that they take. And so this is interesting, you know, when I say, hey guys, the next uh, hot color for next season is going to be purple, it's that decision which is going to be used to create clothes for the next season is very good and big data. Um, new products and services. For us, that's the most important and most interesting thing. There's a tremendous amount of applications over the last 10 years that have been created. There will be big data that will sit behind and make all of those applications smarter and more meaningful to the people using them. Companies that adopt those technologies use them, I think, will be probably most successful. But companies like Uber, companies like Airbnb, are just new products and applications that never existed had the world of big data not existed. That's the only opportunity set. And I think people have to think creatively about where this new uh, application will come from. In essence, my belief is, our belief is, a lot of people's belief is that this world of technology of big data is transforming our lives. We may not know it right now, but a lot of things that are being served up to us are predicated on the decisions being made by using these technologies. Um, more and more people are aware of them, more and more applications are going to be sitting on top of that. And uh, for us at the high, we want to be part of this. I'm going to leave you with this, and then I'm, 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 I'm as a, you know, my uh, much smarter colleague, uh, since when I lead a panel, and we talk more about what the investment themes are. But in essence, when we talk about big data today, it's about being sure you're using a diverse, diverse set of data, not just your workshops, data from all the sources you can get your hands on. Um, you have to really think about where and how you capture it and how you store it so that it's usable. Never throw data away. You just never know how valuable it's going to be, what's in there of value, because today the cost of storing data is almost nothing. So, uh, if you have ideas, if you have an interesting thoughts around this, I'll be around, we can talk more about this. For me, this is the most interesting thing for investing in in the next five to 10 years. And I think we'll take you back to the first slide. There will be companies that will fit in that chart with tens of billions of dollars, hundreds of billions of dollars that will be created on top of this new company. Keep that in mind, and I'll turn it over to you. Are you next? It's um, great to see a number of people I know, Professor Salgopan, Dananjay, a whole slew of people. So thank you for, for coming. Um, what I'll do today is talk about data-driven applications, a whole new world of, of applications, which is using a lot of big data technologies to, to drive it. So if you think about that evolution of, of applications, <clears throat> data-driven applications are the next big thing. So you had, in the very early stages, with mainframe, with uh, client server, you know, the business process automation applications, uh, manufacturing, uh, uh, supply chain, and you know, financial, followed by the era of the PC and front office productivity, followed by kind of anywhere access of the web, social, mobile, and, and, and now uh, data-driven applications. So big data, in our view, big data apps change, change everything. Changes your life as, as a consumer. Uh, and, and the reason this is happening is there's a lot of 
dark data, data that was never utilized, that people are beginning to use. There are many new sensors that are emerging and, and signals that are coming out of the sensors that are driving applications that make a, have a meaning in people's lives. It's, it's doing the same thing for businesses. So um, you, you see uh, across, and we'll talk more about businesses, uh, a big impact on businesses, but not just businesses. Um, when you think about cities, when you think about governments, when you think about planets, um, uh, the, uh, big data is having a big impact. So, so let's talk about business applications and we'll focus first on functional and then we'll focus on industry applications. So there's a next generation of applications to be built by people like you across different functional domains that, that tend to apply to every company out there. So HR, finance, uh, supply chain, uh, IT, security, those types of things. Um, if, you, if you look uh, going further, in, in every vertical industry, we, we feel in the next five to ten years, every industry will be radically transformed with the use of data. And, and so you'll see it early in, in perhaps in media and advertising, retail and e-commerce, but rapidly shifting into other uh, vertical industries. So, so what's special about data-driven applications and what's, what's special about big data? What's, what's really special about big data is, is that it makes better decisions, smarter decisions. So our intuition is typically wrong. Intuition based on sort of experience is, is you know, it's, it's fraught with bias, the like confirmation bias, you know, uh, ego-driven kind of uh, uh, centrality principle, um, you know, various kinds of biases. So data-driven applications, when you look kind of systematically, tend to make better decisions. And they, make deci they can make decisions much faster and in a much more agile manner. So, so what is really sort of driving uh, big data? You heard uh, Arihant, I think, uh, not Arihant, but uh, uh, Suman talked a little bit about sort of big data. Many people associate volume of data with, with big data and, and also kind of real-time streaming data from velocity of data. But big data is not just about volume and velocity of data. It's being able to take data from any data source uh, and it, it may not be sort of conveniently sort of nicely put in a schema, which is unstructured data, or data that's coming out of machines you know, traditional physical machines, or the ability, you know, apps that combine their own data with third-party data, with public data, with social data, and, and derive value from it. But perhaps the most interesting is, is the ability to, to really understand the hidden patterns of, uh, that are in the data and extract value from it. This is the whole area of, uh, of data science. And, and so, Ben, many of you already know this, but we'll talk a little bit about what this data science is about. So, at, at the most fundamental level, it's being able to collect the data and present it to, to in this case, you know, the users, who are the users maybe. So, perhaps collecting from many data sources, which is more in the realm of reports, dashboards, business intelligence. And it answers a, a critical question. What happened? Give me kind of an in-depth view of what happened. The, the next question are, are there. Are the next um, thing to do is to be able to explore that data. And, and so search in particular, and in some cases visualization, is a very powerful tool to allow human beings to explore that data. The, the next aspect comes from, uh, next kind of apps come from using data mining. And, and so here, answering the question, why did it happen? And, and so being able to derive insights from, uh, you know, patterns, from anomalies. 
and, and what you hear a lot of people talk about today, which is predictive applications, using machine learning, using modeling, to say what is likely to happen. If, if I can present an ad to you, an advertisement, and uh, knowing that the chances that you're going to click on it are 92%, that's a very powerful concept. And, and finally, going to sort of close loop, closed loop systems, where, where you have machines talking to machines and making decisions together. So, so think of that as, as a sort of taxonomy of um, data science, sort of at a very broad level, from moving from the bottom to the top, coming from visibility, insights, actionability to actions, um, going kind of from more manual, where a human being is, is, is in the center, to approaches where uh, it's much more automated. So I'll take a few examples. And, and I'll take first an uh, example of marketing, and then we'll talk about retail. So, so the name of the game in, in marketing now is, is, is targeting and personalization, and personalization to an audience of, of one. So, so if you see uh, the first step of that process, is to know that audience of one, and, and to use sort of traditional demographic techniques to, to understand their interests, to, to be able to understand who their friends are, um, uh, if they have given, you know, if you're able to capture, for example, on a website or something like that, it's extreme behavior which, which reflects their behavior, and, and like, for example, in search, it's any expression of intent. So this allows us to to really build um, a user profile and then building a whole series of models to, to be able to predict, in, in many cases, predict before they even know uh, what they want. So, so this is sort of where the game is being played right now. And so if you take an example of, of retail, uh, after sort of big waves of um, you know big box stores and supply just in time inventory and so forth, in, in retail the, the game today is, is all about being customer centric and, and being able to use different kinds of data, transaction data, uh, shopper behavior, social data, product catalog data, uh, focusing on personalization, targeting, optimization of lifetime value doing it consistently across different channels and, and addressing a variety of different problems, whether it's user acquisition, user retention, upsell, cross-sell, offers and promotions, product recommendations. There's a wealth of opportunities just in e-commerce and, and retail. And, and that uses uh, the concepts we talked about, combination of different data, from unstructured, structured sources, using data science to, to derive this value. <coughs> Just briefly on unstructured data, so you, you see uh, different data sources, you see log data, you see rich media, you, you see clickstream data, so every click that you make on an e-commerce site, there's a lot of social data, resulting in a number of different opportunities. And, and very similarly, you, you see around machine data, and following me, Derek uh, from Futura will talk about M2M and opportunities in more detail about uh, this space. But you can see that taking traditional physical sensors and giving them digital interfaces and connectivity, like IP connectivity, is, is a very powerful thing. There are two big, big trends emerging from it. One in the consumer space, Internet of Things, one in the industrial space, uh, around the industrial internet. Consumer space focused a lot on connected home, connected car, uh, all around health and the different wearable devices that we have. In early stages of evolution, you'll see an architecture like this, where data is going up into sort of the cloud and enabling a variety of applications. But at later stages, if you have, a, let's say, a connected home or connected car, these different machines, these different sensors will talk to each other in a closed-loop manner and make decisions. 
uh, take an example of, of the connected car. Um, Sumant talked about ways. So you, you see sort of first a whole new set of technologies being deployed in cars. Uh, much uh, you have a data hub which is collecting data from different sensors. There are, there are new uh, digital instrumentation technologies. There's there's um, IP connectivity. You know, I went to Mexico in February. All the data that was coming out of these race cars, real time, was being displayed in dashboards at a central location. So you have IP connectivity uh, because there's so much rich data. The big if you look at the Tesla, there's a big screen, and so to interact with it, you need voice-related technologies, voice controls. So what this is doing is enabling opportunities uh, in, in the operational area. Uh, big, big space right now is the application space. So before you even get to cars, it's just carrying your phone in the car with you, and then cars itself enabling a whole set of applications. Insurance is a, is a very big space because um, insurance with, uh, when you instrument your, uh, through your phone or your car, you understand a lot about the behavior of the driver and, and insurance can, is very interested in that. Um, going all the way, so we talked about, he gave an example of the, the whole concept of cars on demand, virtualization of cars, but, but the sort of promise line here is, is the self-driven autonomous cars. And so you're already seeing capabilities uh, there. So data uh, approaches have to go a long way before the self-driven cars become a reality. A uh, quick uh, overview of the industrial internet. So better reliability, better quality, better efficiency. So essentially what you're doing is taking an old style um, area, kind of industrial machines, industrial controls, and, and, uh, and adding intelligence to it. And perhaps the most exciting area here is about new products and new business models. The reason there is a jet engine there is Rolls-Royce, GE, uh, are, are developing new models of, of renting out jet engines to, to big airlines, as opposed to selling them jet engines. So, so it's a whole different opportunity. And so this is a slide from Jeff Melt at GE. So the way he describes it is uh, industrial revolution, big rotating machines, power plants, resulted in the creation of GE. Internet revolution, GE sitting on the sidelines, Facebook, Google, Amazon, a number of these companies were built. But with the, with the combination of uh, the industrial equipment and, and the internet, you'll see a third big way, uh, GE, uh, Schneider Electric, Siemens, Hitachi, a whole set of companies want to play again. So, so really in conclusion, there's, there's a whole new uh, set of apps to be built. They're very early on, you know, I would say other, other than search and, and social, uh, uh, a lot of apps to be built in a lot of different areas. And we hope that you will be the ones to build the apps. Thank you.
I'm leading the Higher India Initiative. Uh, my professional career has been in the IT services space, uh, primarily with my family business, Pati Computers, that we sold a couple of years ago. So, what is Higher India, right? Uh, we call ourselves a platform to fund and launch businesses that have aspirations to create companies within the data analytics and the big data space. So, as we see uh, uh, by the graphic up top, it starts with capital, but really what's more important is the mentoring and the partnership approach that we provide to help these companies to get to the next level. Um, the entity is going to be based out of Mumbai and Bangalore, and I must say that over my frequent trips to Bangalore uh, over the past few months, and very much validated by the people in this room, I'm incredibly impressed by the ecosystem of technologists, entrepreneurs, and startups that exist in the city, uh, the kind of Bay Area style thinking that exists um, uh, in, within this ecosystem, and we're very excited to set up operations in Bangalore in the near future. The High India platform is co-founded by me um, and my brother Amit, who's part of the audience today as well. To touch very quickly uh, again upon the opportunity around big data and why it particularly excites us, I think uh, all, all of us are already familiar with the three P's uh, around this space, volume, variety, and velocity. And uh, companies are already using the data that they have to make business decisions and to help their companies do better. Uh, we believe that over the next few years, this is going to evolve rapidly and the entire ecosystem of structured and unstructured data is going to be used in a far more powerful manner and an impactful manner by corporations worldwide. Already, uh, McKinsey has, has predicted this industry to grow to 55 billion by 2017, and as Suman pointed out earlier on today, even that might be uh, an underrepresented number. I also think that we as um, uh, a, a India has a competitive advantage in this space uh, in that the, uh, the kind of statisticians, engineers, technologists and entrepreneurs that we have in this area. And lastly, I guess the graph really depicts where the opportunity lies a little bit. So of course there's an explosion of data, but then there is relevant data which is used to really make the right business decisions. And I think applications that play within this space uh, and help leverage relevant data for uh, increasing top line or reducing costs of companies uh, will build a lot of value going forward. So the, so the high idea is a combination of two forces. Uh, the first one being the Kapti family, which is me and my brother. And uh, you know, going back, uh, my father and his brothers were one of the first uh, uh, companies in the IT services space in the 70s. At that time, we were excited to leverage uh, the new technology wave of the 70s, which was IT services, uh, and build a business uh, upon those fundamentals. And I regard myself as really fortunate to have seen a business go from inception to execution to exit over a period of 30 years and create considerable value. And that's the kind of value we're trying to recreate with big data uh, through the hive. After we exited Partner a couple of years ago, my brother and I were very excited to catch the next wave of technology, and we have a couple of bets out there, uh, one of which is uh, in the internet space in India, uh, which we are leading through a venture fund called Nirvana Venture Advisors. Uh, that's an independently managed fund in partnership with Rajan Mehra, who in fact is hosting our panel right after I finish speaking. Uh, and the high idea is to um, play out our bet on big data. The second uh, force uh, as part of this combination is the high in Silicon Valley. You've already heard Ravi and Suman speak, uh, and Lance, who's the CTO of the high, is going to talk a little bit later about technologies around big data. And I must say that this is one of the most tremendous uh, set of entrepreneurs, executives, technologists, investors uh, that have come together, that have built successful businesses in the past, that have exited businesses in the billion dollar range, and that have now created a deep domain expertise within big data and a tremendous brand around this in the valley. 
So this is just a representation of some of the companies they've come with, that they've invested in, and some of the technologies that they work with. <coughs>
So Shekhar has been an active angel investor in Bangalore since 2007 and has advised several early stage startups in and around Bangalore. Before joining Excel, Shekhar headed hair sign in India as country manager. Shekhar serves on the board of Fresh Desk, Hotel Logics, Mobstag, and Showwaves. Um, Shekhar holds a PhD in computer science from the University of Minnesota and ME from the Indian Institute of Science and a B in computer science from the University of Mysore. Uh, we'd love to hear, you know, Axel has been doing a lot of stuff in this space globally. We'd love to see how you guys are thinking about the opportunity in India. And, uh, you know, lastly, I'd like to invite someone I've known and respected for a long time, uh, Suman, who set up Clearstone in India and uh, has been my partner for many years. He's been the co founder of The Hive <coughs> that works with entrepreneurs to help create businesses that leverage data. Uh, he's a managing partner at Clearstone Ventures, an early stage tech venture fund with 700 million under management. Um, you know, some of the companies that he's been involved with are Rubicon Project, Cetus, Apture, Ankina Networks, Mimosa Systems, and Casion Systems. And in India, Sumat has been actively involved. He set up Clearstone's presence here, and uh, he sits on the board of Build Desk, Games to Win, and uh, he's currently sitting on the board of two companies, Open Box and his name. So that's the panel we have. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to spend some time with a few questions that I have prepared that I'd love to tee off with, and then we'll try and involve uh, the rest of the audience and see what what conversations make sense to the audience. Um, so I'm going to <coughs> is the mic working? Working mic. But that is yet to reserve 
in value for the enterprises. And before the hype cycle stops, you need some very interesting applications, both for enterprises as well as consumers, to translate. And that's where the big data fund uh, came in because we're starting to see so much one can do. They already have the data, but there's not enough work going on on top of the platforms. And that's where the, the genesis for the US. With respect to India, just to close, you know, I, I think we should drop big from big data for India. Just say data. Because I would say, you know, <clears throat> less than 1% of enterprise is data driven today in India. So if you leapfrog, you know, all the old models of uh, BI and all of them, use the modern tools, which are probably one tenth the cost, and enable enterprises to be data driven and create value. That itself is a massive outcome for India and Southeast Asia. But as well as you combine US market, Indian entrepreneurs will, will, will discuss more. No, that, that's actually very helpful. And I think, as one illustrated, there's a few examples of companies that have uh, developed consumer <laughs> applications driven by big data. And so much you often talk about you know, data driven applications. In the, I remember at the time you were setting up the hive. Uh, there was this level of excitement coming out of, uh, at the time you had seen this as a company, and then there's a lot of stuff happening around you. You know, talk to us a bit more about maybe, you know, see, see this as a company as an example, or I think you have Deep Forest, uh, as an example of a company that you're, you're doing a lot of. So what are the things within those companies that you find um, led to the insight to also build out the higher level? You know, there's, so obviously people here in the audience know how I feel about this space because you know, I just talked about it a little while ago. I don't actually absolutely agree with the fact that there is a, uh, a tremendous amount of interest in the world of big data. However, people who are actually deriving value in the world of enterprises out of big data is very, very small. And, you know, it's always the same problem BI had in the past, which is, um, a lot of times, you don't know what the right question to ask is. If you don't know what the right question to ask, you don't expect to get the right answer. And so, there's a lot of that going on right now. In fact, one of the Excel's portfolio company, Cloudera, is a partner of the high level. They're in our offices all the time, they're in their offices all the time, because we both need each other to exist, the application, and completely a sort of ecosystem to evolve. And there's a tremendous amount of opportunity there, because it's a, it's a real pain point in reaching out people's uh, business and decision making. For me, what the real sort of insight was, and you know, before people, people were building uh, companies on top of this technology stack before the world big data became fashionable. So at some point, it will become unfashionable also, right? So if someone comes to me with a pitch and say, oh, we're a big data company, obviously that's not going to get as much attention as someone says, hey, I've come here to disrupt the world of X, Y, and Z, and here's the technologies we're going to use to get some competitive differentiations. One of those technologies is going to be big data or dedicated on this platform of big data. So, you know, we did a company called CTES, which was a big data analyst company in the cloud, sold it to VMware about a year ago. And a company called Rubicon Project that's processing billions of transactions a day, and hundreds of billions of transactions a day, and so generating data that you can't even imagine. And in all our portfolios, there'll be companies that have similar sort of uh, thing. But one thing I noticed is everybody spends an inordinate amount of time technically trying to create the infrastructure of big data. All of these companies are trying to create infrastructure, which exactly look like each one had their own. Cloudera is one example of it, going after the enterprise market. In, in the case of uh, Palmatic, this is very similar to Palmatic. Everybody does the same thing. Inmobi has the same backend, and, and Cloudera is you know, building that backend, selling it to people. And, Rubicon has the same backend, Google has the same backend. This sort of thing like you should commoditize this backend, let people focus on building applications, which is where the genesis of the high came from. Lance is going to talk about how that form and what we give to the people who are building companies. Forget about focusing on the infrastructure side, because you know what? There's enough action there. A lot of open source stuff, lots of distributions, lots of stuff happening. What's going to happen on the applications that are going to use all of this intelligently? If that's the insight, the sort of excitement around at least the reason why the high makes sense to you. So you know, my, my sort of way to look at it is to say, there's a lot of talent here in Bangalore in India. There's a lot of 
people who have energy and passion for creating new companies, and you can help them bridge that. And all of us sitting on this, this table, all four of us are in the business of doing that. That'd be awesome. That'd be really great. Fantastic. I think uh, that so in terms of setting up uh, the scope of opportunity, that's that's been so very helpful. You know, Sandeep and Shekhar, this specifically is, you know, I'd love to get both of your insights into this. <clears throat> the number of companies we see that are in the so-called big data space uh, are companies that are selling to large enterprises, but selling services and solutions, which candidly could be a very large opportunity. Um, you know, how are you advising companies or how do you look at companies that are looking for venture funding, but have models that are I'd say more within the services and solutions bucket as opposed to platform and product bucket. Are you trying to guide them towards building platforms or is it that you're encouraging them to be more better? Yeah, so if you look at uh, our own uh, journey, we started uh, uh, for one of the early investment was in New Sigma. If you look at New Sigma that happened uh, almost in uh, five, six, seven years back, uh, where the was the only co founder, but actually, um, that was a time for the services being a niche very early on, using data as a service and becoming an extended team to the CEO office to be able to answer what if questions, using India as an example with the statisticians and using SaaS product and so on. So if you look at that, there are several similar examples that have built similar companies. We're not very busy in scale, but enough scale from India Several examples of the legal side and various other places using data and services to a play, uh, to a play where it's not easy to automate. But it has to be very niche and narrow, a lot of deep domain expertise. And being in India is very much essential. If those opportunities come, we're still interested. But what happens is the services look like it will be disrupted with technology in another year or two then you are in trouble in those kind of services. Now, with respect to platforms, <coughs> it's the same question I, kind of, I ask that any entrepreneur walking through our world is the same team is saying the value, access to hire in the US in their office versus that team sitting in Bangalore working with us, US customers. What is the chance of them succeeding in beating the value team? If the answer is not clear, then I'm not sure how we can fund that opportunity. Unless there's an edge being in Bangalore or being in India with a team and the structure or cost or data. So there are elements of that we see. For example, if data is very noisy and there are not enough tools to clean it and you need human data, then being in India makes a lot of sense. And that gives an edge, we want to use that. So if there's no edge per se for pure tech play, I look and feel like another value company, but I'm in Bangalore going after the US market. Less interest. Yeah, uh, I think uh, I just want to add to some of what Sheikh said. No one, uh, in terms of services, uh, we looked at the space about two, three years ago. I think New Sigma was also in the market at the time when Sequoia had just in it. And uh, we actually decided to stay away because we felt that there wasn't enough of a talent pool to really scale these businesses and make them the size of the emphasis of the growth of the world. Uh, and so, uh, very early on, our decision was we would focus more on companies building platforms and applications. Uh, and we probably, you know, as you said, we weren't early on in a new Sigma or absolute data or any of these guys that got created. So, uh, as, a, as a fund, our focus wasn't really on services. Um, the services companies actually, I would generally say, have surprised me. They have done much better and have become larger than I would have expected them to become. Uh, some of that has happened because they themselves realized that there wasn't enough talent available, so they built tools and platforms and predictability into their models and were able to hire people that weren't as sort of smart data scientists that I thought we would require to really scale these businesses and have actually built you know, scalable businesses. So I think that model is still possible, that you can build companies where you, you build uh, like services companies, for instance, that which, where, to Shana's point, you know, the data is too uh, noisy or whatever. And by building two relevant tools, you can actually build businesses that 
can scale and, and serve certain markets in the US or in other global markets. Uh, I think text, you know, textual analytics still remains a space where there's possibility for you know, people to do this from India. Um, we actually, again, as I said, put a different side in front of those around applications and so on. And I agree with Shekhar that yes, you do need to have uh, you know, a competitive position relative, relative to your peers in, in global markets who are competing with you. And nobody cares today whether you know, you're from India or you're from the US. All that people care about is do you have the best product or the best service to offer. And uh, we've seen that with this company we backed out of Chennai, Index, where uh, you know, they're in the pricing analytics space. And today they are working with some of the leading players in the US. Nobody asks them, you know, where, where are the data scientists sitting, or where did this product get developed, right? All they care about is what is the quality of the dashboard you're providing me. So uh, when, you, when you think about this, the most important thing to think about is, is what you're building really truly really unique and meets the customer requirements? And that's where the challenge lies, is how do you, how do you define customer requirements? Sitting here, how do you get to those customers, your initial lighthouse customers that will help you Define those requirements. So hopefully, you will define them initially, but your definition will be 80% there. But to work with those customers and get them to the level where you know you go in and it's a big sharp message. You say, "Here's what I have for you. Here's what the dashboard looks like." The guy says, "Oh, this just meets my needs." Right? And that's what you need to get to because ultimately, sales in this space, you know, to get to the value creation, sales have to happen quickly. You know, customers have to. There's a lot of I said, there's a lot of hype right now saying, oh, I, I support big data or I'm a big data company. People's eyes glaze over. They don't want to hear that. They want to hear, I am having a problem with my competitive analytics. Can you help me? You know, I'm having a problem with the pricing analytics. Can you help me? That's what they're looking for. They're not looking for big data. They're looking for solutions to their problems. Fantastic. So we have time for this one last question that I'll ask each of you. Uh, and I'm going to throw it up to the audience. So, Suman. What would uh, you know? What would you advise an entrepreneur sitting in the audience around how they should think about uh, raising funding for their startup, or, or just you know how they should chase their dreams? What should I do? Well, first, <laughs> let me just respond to Kalam because I was in Japan with the IF team a few days ago, and we met for the last you know, three days of meetings and six meetings a day with big enterprises. Well, I think they're in, you know, forget about this panel and maybe people in the government, it's very deep. There are tremendous pain points. Everybody is as interested in it and doesn't know what they are doing. It's, it's mind boggling how much money is waiting to be spent in this space. Whether it's services, whether it's vertically focused, whether it's platforms, whatever. They're signing tens of millions of dollars of deals with Cloudera and then they're sitting there. It's chef, it's, it's chef, it's sitting there. Nothing, no, no one's using it. So there's a tremendous amount of opportunity. But money raising, chasing your dreams, don't raise money if you, don't, if you can get away with that. Just do not. Investors are paid in the ass. And you know, that's what we're paid to do. You know, and unfortunately, that's how we make money. We have to be up, you know, sitting on top of you. So if you can get away with it, don't raise it. Don't raise money. Um, solve some customers' real pain. Think about how big that market is. I mean, if you can solve a small pain for a large market, it can be a very valuable company. I do think that I completely agree with you. There's a tendency in India to try and do something cheaper than has been done in the US. You say, oh, we can do it cheaper, so we'll have a market. Doesn't matter. People will pay for quality. They will pay. This cost arbitrage stuff doesn't work. You have to really think creatively, you have to be a global business, you have to be close to your customers. And if you're sitting half around the world, there's an advantage and a disadvantage. The advantage is you can sort of have to make a cycle, the disadvantage is you're not close to your customers. So you're going to figure out how to make it across that bridge. I'm very excited about you know, I've made a bunch of companies in the last two, three years. I've been investing in India for the last seven, eight years. And our companies here have done very well. Compared to the global investments, actually they've outperformed their investments in the US on dollars in dollars. So there's tremendous opportunity in India. I don't want to take away from that, but get away from this cost nonsense and think about value and really solving the cost of the problem. And then don't, don't, don't raise money from VCs. Very happy to know. So I'm going to tell us how to business, but I want to throw it up to the audience because we have just five minutes.
So we'll take a few questions and then we'll wrap up. Yeah. Can you just speak loud? Yeah, sure. Hi, uh, I'm a text analytics researcher with Musica. So uh, you've been talking a lot about this. Um, I, I have this thing, so I'm working in the field of text mining, text analytics. I want to know, in your opinion, uh, who has a better uh, so who has a better chance of disrupting, uh, bringing the next disruptive innovation in, uh, let's say, text mining? Would it be a large uh, company like Musica or uh, somewhat smaller uh, uh, startup? <laughs> yeah, so uh, it's a very tough question actually because when you ask us to predict where it will be. But you can start seeing the elements of this. Uh, I don't know if you saw the Google's announcement about deep learning. And if you look at that part, it's up for grabs for anybody because historically now you have machine learning, big data. Now they have open source quite a lot of text, word relationships with the semantic relationships of various things. So in another five years, some of that will start getting you know, mainstream. So some interesting companies could come out, could be from big company, probably not from music. Music is DNA is not about going and solving those kind of companies, those kind of problems, right? But they're making money and they're growing in a different way. This has to be something new because it takes a lot of deep analysis, but just starting to happen. Whereas if you're based on access to data, right, all your things are based on access to data, obviously big companies have more data than you get access to. So that part, if you know, is about text analytics, about resumes, my, my assumption is LinkedIn is going to beat anybody else one day because so much of data is there. By the time you get access to the data, you'll never perfect it. So it depends on where you're positioning and what it is. If it's data dependent, the big guys will do it. If it's purely research, algorithm dependent, and with minimal data, you can demonstrate some success. And somebody may be interested in using it. Thank you. This gentleman here. Hi, Sanjay. Uh, so, uh, yeah. sure. uh, what are the opportunities in a uh, sector like healthcare or water in India? With the data is not that freely available, but uh, how can uh, big data be a part of it? Sandeep, you deal with both healthcare. Yeah, so uh, you know, uh, it's, a, it's a good question. Water, I'm not so sure. Uh, it's a very, uh, one of the problems with water right now is that it's a very disorganized sector, uh, and particularly in the, uh, the government market, I don't think there's enough happening that is data connection you can do, so try that. Healthcare, I think there is there is activity that's, uh, that we're seeing around uh, both clinical data collection as well as uh, uh, even you know, insurance companies and so on. Uh, so you uh, could potentially, you know, I think going in that space at this point at least would require you to build some sort of enterprise solution, go to the private guys and say, you know, I have a solution, would you partner with me? I don't think anybody will offer you the data as a third party and say, hey, you know, work with this data and create an application around it. Consumers don't control data in India right now, that's part of the challenge. Uh, so getting consumer data uploaded into your system is still, uh, you know, if you can actually, let me put the data back. If you can actually create a, a compelling value proposition for customers to ask their healthcare providers for the data and then upload it into your system, it would be a very interesting thing. So one last question for me, gentlemen. Uh, I'm Sridhar from Resources, uh, uh, enough has been said, and I go to a lot of these events, enough has been said about the opportunity of big data. We take a lot of pride in the kind of technical skills that we have and the kind of stuff we have achieved. But uh, there is one challenge, and that is a question to you all. Is, uh, I find uh, in my journey is uh, a lack of good quality mentoring, which is on a consistent way, especially in an area like uh, big data. Now, we have built an enormous number of uh, uh, exploration, explorative solutions for both enterprise and consumer. Uh, we're all the time trying, but uh, we've been failing a lot because somehow sitting here, I find it difficult to get real 
of good reason. It's a for gen loose generalities that I get. So my uh, question is that, and a suggestion would be to people at IIS to have people coming in here on a regular basis from that market, this US, and get them to come here, spend time, work qualifies, and get active mentoring, maybe once a quarter kind of stuff. So it helps them to really build beyond uh, talking about this business plans. Yeah, you know, thank you for articulating that. That's a very good sales pitch for that. So we do this in the Bay Area. I think good, good firms do this on a regular basis. But what I've realized is, you know, I've been in the venture business for a long time, the Hive is a very unique initiative because it's focused on a space. Now, to me, that space is very broad from my perspective, but it is still a space. And so what we did is we got people who we respect in this space, both on the business side and technology side, whether it was the president of servers and tools at Microsoft, or the CEO of VMware, or the CEO of NetApp, the head guy at Facebook was dealing with big data, the, you know, whatever. But then Bill Lance's help, who was early on, put an advisory board together for the time. <coughs> advisory boards are great. They're only as good as what you use them for. So what we've done is we have events that we bring people in. And we're going to do the same here. I mean, we do this on a regular basis. Um, you know, some of these events will be virtual events that you attend in the high. We have meetups, which are every week on Wednesday, we have between 150 and 500 people show up for an event. And that event may be very narrow about visualization or something around that, or a very broad one, which the last one we had is, you know, where does SQL and big data sit on sort of together and how they work together, and people from Microsoft and people Cloudera and Hortonworks and MapR and all fighting with each other about who's right, who's wrong. So it's interesting to know this. So this is not a problem you need to Bangalore or to do. This is a problem you need to the world of startups. We're trying to figure out how to take decisions and get post mentoring. And I guess that's why you know people aspire to get maybe some VCs involved because they feel like they can give them that exposure and openness. And hopefully we can bring more to that as well. So thanks a lot, folks. So, you know what we're going to do? We're going to get out to have a coffee, so we'll have a networking session. Uh, and I just want to stay on schedule because we have uh, a few more people coming by. So we'll catch up. We'll catch up with someone outside. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, so.
of uh, use cases which are generated in our oil uh, We'll also show some of how some of these use cases are fungible across the industry, oil and gas, building, and this kind of areas. And we share some of the mistakes that are about us in the So to start with a little cow story uh, on what, what is the end So if you, if you look at what's common to cows in the Netherlands and New Zealand, uh, apart from the fact that uh, uh, these form a big part of their economy, which generate a lot of dairy products and stuff like that, increasingly they're getting uh, instrumented. So for example, uh, there's this company in the Netherlands, uh, which is focused on the problem of detecting pregnancy early in cows. So they've got a sensor which is embedded within the ears of the cow. So the farmer is able to better treat the cows differentially than the rest of the cows. And there's also another interesting case study where uh, cows in New Zealand, uh, so every time they urinate, uh, a lot of the groundwater gets uh, polluted. So they try to understand the behavior. So they have cows which have a GPS as well as uh, fluid sensors attached to it so that that behavior is understood so that they can uh, through it uh, at this cow from happening. So essentially what we are having is uh, cows are having nightmares in the world. So increasingly more and more uh, cows are getting instrumented. So basically Ember is nothing but uh, more uh, devices and sensors getting connected to the threats. So the year 2008 was going Or there is a lot of uh, commercial loss. 
So we have people uh, actually creating electricity. Uh, we have a lot of old equipments uh, which need uh, to be replaced, uh, pretty inefficient. Uh, which results in a lot of outages. And outage has not been studied at a very granular level, at a street level or a local level. And connecting smart meters allows you to do that. And another important problem for the uh, power industry is that, at least in a country like India, there's a last minute procurement of energy. And whenever you procure energy at the last minute, uh, it's extremely expensive. So once you start having a granular smart meter data, you'll be able to you predict consumption habits, uh, which are much more uh, accurate so that you can buy power up front. Again, there are households which are not using uh, efficient bulbs. So you'll be able to pinpoint at a household level which are behaving uh, apparently to the rest of the neighborhood. These are things which are possible once you start connecting granular. Again, uh, electricians have to be deployed to various uh, regions, neighborhoods, and how do you deploy uh, electricians to the right uh, uh, street levels or the outages is, is a question which can be best answered using all the data which is collected. So at the end of the day, a one person reduction in technical or commercial loss can unleash millions of dollars. So a small movement of meaning is sufficient uh, for the whole project to take itself off. So let's go into the details a little bit. So if you look at a smart meter, what does it start collecting? It collects what is called as a change of value with uh, voltage, the state of the uh, power consumption at the household level. And there are various types of events which are collected. There are damper events, outage events, uh, you know, any uh, meter events, for example, that of the uh, smart meter is low, etc. Et Once you start collecting, for example, in the case we are working with, they're collecting it every 15 minutes uh, from the 1.5 million households. And we'll talk a little bit about the initial ROI, which are the ROI generated use cases which were uh, juiced out of this data. Uh, the first one was uh, in real time, almost in near real time, they're able to identify hotspots as to which neighborhoods are experiencing pain, what is the frequency of the outages, what is the reasons of the outage, duration of the outage. And, and this information can be utilized, it's very, very granular. You can tell timing. And then you'll be able to give it to the street level information. This is incredibly useful. And if someone wants to drill down to now have the capability to go up to the machine level to find out the state of the device itself. And again, if you want to look at trending data, that is also possible. So this is one use case where at a high level you're able to see bird's eye of all the hotspots, drill down specific equipment, and then draw a timeline as to how the device. Uh, responded across time. The other major use case is uh, 10 to 7 is normally the peak time for people who are using electricity. And during that time, you don't want people to, you want to discourage some people from using electricity externally. So you could price electricity differentially at that point in time so as to encourage behavior at off peak hours. That is another very powerful use case we are seeing for this market. The third thing is, uh, whenever an outage happens, there could be multiple uh, causes for an outage. It, it could be a machine was wrongly calibrated, it could be because of the load, or it could be because of the experienced electrician. Now, by analyzing the sequence of events, it's possible right now to analyze granular sequence of events to be able to pinpoint which of those causal things are leading to an outage and uh, kind of take the corrective action on that. So, and if you go to building, if you expand that a little bit, if you look at uh, building management systems, uh, increasingly you're, going, you're seeing a lot of uh, sensors being attached uh, to, to, let's say, the flow meters, boilers, chillers, getting temperature, getting pressure, getting the rate at which the fluid is flowing through. All this can be used to uh, measure the risk of an adverse event happening in a uh, building. And today there are new business models around remote monitoring, which are also uh, enabling, enabled using the uh, mission generated data. So with that, I'll just walk you through a small maturity curve we have uh, to see where the opportunity is like. So if you look at the lowermost end of the spectrum, it's a device uh, which is just doing what it's supposed to do, it's not instrumented. Uh, 
uh, at the higher level of maturity, what we have is it is capturing that information and it's locally flushed. That's level one of them. At level two, what we have is it's capturing some information, it's doing some minor, and there is some level of edge intelligence. So it's able to take some corrective action, for example, when shutter temperature goes up, it automatically corrects itself or shuts down something. And at the highest level, level six, you, you'll be able to look at devices across the whole ecosystem and triangulate on what would probably happen for that device. What is the probability that the device would go down? So that, that's a huge spectrum. If you look at today's world, most of the devices are at either 0, 1, or 2. And the opportunity you have is to take them to 3, 4, 5, 6 over the next couple of years. So with that, uh, I'll quickly touch upon what are the use cases. So if you look at the use cases, primarily it is to mitigate risk or to increase the safety, uh, whether it's an oil break or whether it's a building management system, or to unlock efficiencies as in the smart meter system. So these are some of the places where Fushuna is going to work, where we are experiencing some of these use cases, whether it's oil and gas, smart building, telecom, or uh, utility related things. And once you get that data, what you do is you stream it into a platform. You have real-time sensible pipelines, just sucking all this information, probably at a minute level, all the change of value and all the alarm events. And you have massive machine learning as well, you deeply learning uh, the patterns which are so far undetected. And at the end of the day, what happens is this has to be consumed by four uh, different personas, as we call it. Uh, one is the command center executor, the guy who's actually looking for exceptions in the device. And once the device exception is detected, he quickly passes on control to a field technician. And uh, what a field technician then does is goes to a checklist and he tries to resolve that problem. Then there's a third set of guys who are sitting in the head office, maybe a van designer, who's interested in knowing when did his device go down and what the frequency of which his device is going down and wants to make sure that he's able to uh, make pretty good most of the companies uh, what is happening on the field and what is happening that the designer's office is not really well connected. And one of the opportunities we have is to make sure that the uh, head office designers be able to listen to field level problems. And finally, there's a process optimizer. He does not have a single device view of things. He looks at the world across devices. You could look at Honeywell devices, you could look at Siemens devices. That's across devices, and his intent is to optimize the process. Whether it is to lower the uh, amount of energy in a building, or it is to reduce safety, he cuts across devices. So that's broadly uh, the things on the left extreme. We have the devices, and we have sensors, which are emitting events. All this put into a massive uh, cluster, we have to cluster any noise in the database, we crunch it, generate insight, and these are the four uh, consumers uh, of this thing. So, so, what are the three important lessons we learned? Uh, we have executed a couple of projects, and we just want to share three uh, important lessons. The first one is uh, most of the current solutions look at one device at a time or one event stream at a time. And uh, the context in this device operates is not known. For example, the ambient temperature is not known. This relation of this fire alarm to its ecosystem is not known. So it's very important to triangulate the signals and not look at a signal in isolation. Uh, that is the first important thing here. The second thing is, uh, at least uh, from our perspective, we found that these three techniques have been very handy in uh, surfacing some interesting patterns, whether it's frequency sequences, large gaps or text mining. We have been able, been able to find some pretty interesting patterns by using this. And last but not the least, uh, more than machine learning and, and sensor data, I think this uh, lot of signals have to be harvested from the field come from field technicians themselves. Uh, they are privy to a lot of data which is not currently captured or transmitted. So some of the gamification related principles of application design will help them change their behavior so that they're able to get a reverse flow of information from the technicians who are intimately in touch with the devices on a daily basis. Uh, with that, I come to the last slide. So we actually see machine data as being gold because if you flush machine data, you're increasing the chances of that device going down. 
and, and that is a good risk being introduced into the system. So next time you flush sensor data, you have to think that you're putting lives at risk. Thank you. basically create a, a large bottleneck and 
this wouldn't scale, it's not cost effective. So a lot of problems can actually be solved by what is called sharding, right? So sharding is just take this large problem, split it all up, and give each machine a different set of the web, and you're, you're, all, you're all good. Um, except for the fact that if you're trying to find out what is the top page, if you sharded the web into, let's say, a thousand pieces, you're going to find a thousand top pages. What, are, what is actually the top page? How do you rank that? How do you figure out what the top terms are? So just sharding the problem um, isn't enough. And so Google really went and really went and uh, did a lot of deep diving into this problem. And uh, in order to, to be able to distribute both the computation of finding this and the data, run it on commodity hardware so they can make it very cheap to expand out, uh, and also to make it resilient not have a piece of hardware that they had to design to make this fault tolerant. They actually went to software, so they do software um, to do all this. And the two big pieces of this uh, were the distributed file system and map reduce. So just briefly about those. So uh, the distributed file system takes a file, and the file in this case could be terabytes or petabytes. It's a very large file. It could be a, a file of all of your web crawls um, across the entire internet in this case. For so instead of having blocks like the blocks on your hard drive, which could be very small blocks, they now made blocks that are 64 megabytes blocks of, of this data. And they distribute it across data nodes, which were thousands of actual servers, right? And these servers, not only were the blocks of data spread across the servers, they were also replicated one, two, three, four times. So that if a, a data node failed, it was using a problem. And this is how software is used to, to be able to replicate and, and distribute your data. And then the name node managed all of this and, and, uh, and uh, figured out the name space of where all the blocks were to reassemble your file. So that was one step of the problem. The other one was how do you actually distribute the compute? So now that you have all your data distributed everywhere, if you want to distribute the uh, calculate the very top page rank, you can't bring all that data now back to a single compute node. You have to take that compute and send it out to the data and process it out there. And so the algorithm they came up with was MapReduce, which allows you to write code to uh, send out to all of your data. And uh, the technique is to create key value pairs of whatever you're processing, take all the keys, shuffle, and sort them. So, um, a single machine gets all of the values that are for a single key, which then you can further process the output. So it's actually a simple idea, and uh, but allows you to do a multitude of algorithms on top of this. So this kind of brings us to Hadoop. So Hadoop were uh, was taking the white papers that Google produced for MapReduce and, and the distributed file system, bringing them together. Um, and building it out as an open source stack. So I was at Yahoo when there was about four people on the Duke, a new team, and we were building out the, the ad systems on top of this, which really revolutionized how we could do matching at Yahoo. And um, as this got built out, more and more companies like Facebook, Twitter, etc., used it. Um, it got them, and Cloudera and Hortonworks and companies hardened it. It actually moved into the enterprise. We see people like Sears now, the New York Times, Telefonica, and um, it's hard to believe because we're taking this core technology reasoning. So once we have uh, Hadoop code as our base layer, it's our, our distributed compute, now all these other technologies started coming into management. The early days of Hadoop, if you wanted to get data, you wrote your own scripts. Everyone had a different way of getting data into the system. You had your own ways of managing what the schemas were of the data. Everything was kind of the wild west. So, these, so this next set of technologies really came along to be able to manage how data got into the system, um, what the schemes were, and how to process it. So the first piece um, to talk about is, is, um, is the data ingestion piece. And if you go back to the, the, the Vs we were talking about earlier, um, you need to have a very agile way of writing data. Because so many systems is coming in so fast, how do you scale it out and parallelize it? Some of it is, is the variety. So what is um, certain data, like uh, maybe a, a temperature sensor, you're OK to like, miss one. So you're going to be able to drop that on the floor, no problem. But other <coughs> transactional data, you have to guarantee it gets there. If you miss someone's transaction, you've, you've lost important information. 
So the technology that we use in our stack is Flume. There's several others, um, but Flume really gives you all of this flexibility. So Flume uh, is an Apache project, works with uh, Hadoop, HBase, all the, all the uh, uh, Hadoop ecosystem very well. But it has all the same characteristics as Hadoop itself. You can add more hardware at it to scale it out. You can, uh, you can replicate data so that one node fails. You can lose data and you have guarantees. It also you know, it scales up horizontally. We've had hundreds of thousands of messages a second come through uh, by just adding more machines. Uh, the, the next piece is, uh, is workflow. So as uh, the applications today on Hadoop is a lot of data processing. You're, you're trying to take all, all this variety of data that's coming into your system and be able to process it, normalize it, and figure something out. And that turns out to be a workflow. And again, go back to the early Wild West days, it was just a bunch of scripts you wrote and you tried to kind of like weed through what's happening and manage it. Um, there's a, um, a technology now, uh, that actually been on a while, that's getting better and better called Uzi. And what Uzi does is allow, it's basically your programming language for how you process data on Hadoop. And it does a lot of things like looking at when data comes in and being able to trigger what jobs kick off, or, or you can uh, do it more cron like instead of uh, time uh, frame for it. Um, the key piece is you don't have traceability because everything's logged, you have, uh, there's uh, all, all, all types of GUIs that allow you to manage this, and um, also it's also a very scalable, reliable system that actually scales, and it scales on top of the other ecosystem. Um, another another uh, piece of this is schema management. So now, if you, again, given the variety of data you have, you actually are storing it in many, many different ways on Hadoop. And a lot of these uh, um, inputs uh, not only can be different uh, data formats, uh, they're also coming from a lot of different uh, sources that have all sorts of different schemas. And, and if you go back to the workflow we just talked about, you're processing through a lot of different formats and, and you're uh, creating aggregations, you're creating more and more schemas as you go along and how do you handle all this and do a handoff through your workflow. And there's really two, two solutions that we use. One is, is H catalog. And you can think of, uh, in the database world, you, you know, the schema defines your database, right? And, uh, in H catalog, it's taking that kind of meta information and putting it into a central repository that is actually pointing to the files on, the, on your distributed file system or in other, other uh, technologies such as Hive, which is, uh, uh, allows you to do SQL-like queries. So each catalog gives us this way to now have the same way to manage uh, what the schemes are in our data as it hands off through our workflows. The flip side of it is Avro. So Avro, instead of having a centralized metadata repository, uh, now serializes the schemas with the data. So uh, the workflow here is as you're bringing data in from different data sources that you actually uh, will clean it up and then store it as Avro. Once it's in Avro, a lot of the Hadoop ecosystem can read and understand that, so we can read the headers of these files, understand what the schemas are, and then be able to pass it on. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, a serialization format on disk. It's also, you can do RPC, and a lot of the Hadoop uh, technologies can understand the, um, the uh, number of uh, data stream. So uh, moving back, moving up the stack, uh, a little bit to this, uh, the data access layer. And uh, this is, there's actually tons and tons of technologies here for the data access, but the, the, the general idea is uh, it's no longer do you want just a file on, on this distributed file system. Uh, if you have a very large file going into this, it's kind of seeking so read across the seed point to find a record. But if you want to actually do random access to a, a specific record, uh, a file on, on a heavy file system, there's many, many use cases where you want to, to, to be able to, to do a random access key value lookup on the data. And it turns out you can still use a lot of the distributed file system uh, formats if you kind of layer on uh, other technologies on top of that. Uh, Google did a lot of the uh, kind of early work on this and wrote a big table white paper, um, which was used to build some technologies. And then additionally, there's been um, other technologies that are doing SQL on Hadoop, so I'll kind of talk about both those briefly. <coughs> so HBase um, 
is, is what's uh, called the, the big uh, the Hadoop database. And it's, it's kind of a simple sorted map data store, uh, but it's actually on top of Hadoop. So it can, you can do uh, a lot of uh, interesting ways of looking at data on top of this. Um, but it has all the same uh, types of uh, characteristics of, of Hadoop. So you can uh, just throw machines at it. There's failover if the node goes down. You can have data replicated, all these type of things. And um, this actually powers uh, things like the, uh, the message bus at, at Facebook, which handles gigs of data coming in per second um, into each page where they can do lookups on it. And I'll briefly just talk about there's other two other technologies which are, are, are different than HBase, um, um, but in Paul and I really allow you to, uh, if you have these schemas in H catalog or even Avro, you can then actually uh, do select joins any type of uh, SQL commands on top of the data. And uh, that allows your data scientists or, or anyone that's doing data analysis um, to access a, new, a richer functionality on the time to write it from scratch. Next layer is uh, is the analytics. This is a lot of what we were talking about earlier about what where the real power, why you're even doing big data, really comes to this this uh, layer in the stack. Right? And this is where you, you do uh, all your machine learning, clustering, correlations, uh, the heavy data science goes into this. And it turns out that the, the, this this layer has lots of players and lots of technologies, and so. For our startups, we are uh, building a layer where they can plug and play these uh, very easily. So just to um, give uh, a little bit of a, a high level, and again, there's probably like another 30 or 40 technologies to do this. And the, the algorithms are at the bottom where, where you see a lot of the focus in, in data science. And um, we're able to um, plug these in, and depending on our use case, uh, they can they're optimizing for clicks, they're optimizing for security intrusion. Um, we really work with data science to figure out what the best technology stack is to plug in there. Um, the last layer here is uh, one that's it's kind of uh, late to the game because a lot of people, uh, once they have this big data stack, they used to do analytics and, and give you a chart. Um, but we want to be able to have the interactive. Since we're building the, the application layer, we really want to interact with the data. So a lot of this is through search, with recommendation engines, uh, this type of functionality. And um, so there's two, two technologies that we, we're, we uh, have a lot of in-depth experience in. One is, is solar, and solar's been around a long time, but just, uh, I think it was even last week, uh, Cloudera announced their uh, solar on Hadoop 1.0. Uh, which we've been a, a part of. And um, what that really gives you is a search engine tightly integrated with the Hadoop ecosystem. So you can bring data into Hadoop and then and clean it up and then index it into, into solar, you know, we'll replicate it across and, uh, using all of the, the Hadoop uh, file system replication, uh, the indexes and scale it out. So you can have massive amounts of uh, um, data in a search engine available to you using solar and Cloudera. Uh, the other one is, so my, my, a lot of my background is in building search engines and matching engines uh, and recommendation engines. And there isn't actually a, a good solution out of the open source uh, stack. I mean, solar allows you to do a lot of things, but if you want to do a matching of, of a lot of features, so not just looking for DVD player, but DVD player and my my uh, purchase history and my friend's purchase history, who I'm connected to, and all this context, how do you bring that to match in milliseconds against a, a large catalogs? And so uh, we built this matching engine uh, that we use uh, with our startups to be able to do that. So this is the, the stack, and I just wanted to take this and overlay it with a, a use case real quick of one of our companies. The company that we have is in the um, in the security space, trying to find an intruder inside of an enterprise, um, advanced threat detection. And the in order to do the advanced threat, we pull in a lot of data sources. So this is log files from firewalls, uh, deep 
packet inspection, so actually looking at the packet headers um, and even further to find what's going on. So it's a massive amount of information that can happen inside of a large enterprise. We pull all this in uh, into Hadoop and we use Flume to, to do this and to scale it out how we need to do it. And again, using Flume's ability to, to find out what information we drop on the floor we need to capture. And then we, we pull, it all in, pull it all into Hadoop where we process it, learn from it, and uh, clean it up so we can join across logs and package inspections. Pull in uh, external data. This is a variety of data sources. Also includes uh, third-party data about uh, IP uh, addresses and, and, uh, and reputation data about those IPs. We pull it all in into a, a schema we can understand, where we can then process it. We put it into HBase and other tools. We set up jobs in Uzi, and um, and then our data scientists can then model this data to find out what is the normal activity within uh, within. An enterprise network, and then what are the what are anomalies, anomalies look like, and then we give all this tooling using uh, the search technologies and, and matching uh, engine to the certain security analyst. It has a nice dashboard. It's not just a dashboard where they're seeing just nice charts what's happened. They actually can drill down, interact with the data. If they think they see something on the chart that looks like a threat, they can drill down, uh, search for that IP address, see what's happened in its history, and, and so it's a very interactive process that we can move out on now. So this, this whole stack uh, actually applied very well to this use case, um, and we were able to show them how to use it, get them up to speed on it, and build out a, a proof of concept on it. So, but that, that's uh, the presentation.